open the participant open chat. bottom of the participant panel.
Okay. Okay. Well, that's a problem. Hi, I'm Carrie Gardner. I am the moderator. Welcome.
I'd like to welcome everyone. I am Carrie Gardner. I'm your moderator. And um, we will get started very soon. Welcome, er welcome everyone. Um, we will get started here in a few minutes. Welcome everyone. My name is Carrie Gardner. I'm your moderator and we will be starting here soon. Hi, hi, Mr. Means. My name is Carrie Gardner and I'm your moderator. Oh, hi, Carrie. Thank you. Sure. Let me get this straight here. Uh, good. Excellent. Okay. So it's three o'clock. Yes. We should start. Okay. What uh, what do you want me to do other than start? Actually, I think you just start and I'm gonna monitor the chat. Is there anything you would like me to do? I don't think so. I should, I'm gonna do screen share and then. Okay. Go. So it seems like we're recording. Yes. So let me get a little uh, sun here. <clears throat> so welcome to this uh, breakout session. Uh, LEO libraries. Let me go ahead and do a screen share and we'll get underway. Am I displaying there? Yes, you are. Okay. Yes. Yep. Uh, thanks everyone for making it. I know it's a, it's a tall order to 
get involved in this for, for three hours or any part of, uh, but I appreciate it. And hopefully you'll get something out of this 30 minute session. We'll try to get through the slides and, and have as much open conversation as possible. Um, my name is Don Means. I'm the director of the Gigabit Libraries Network. We're an open global consortium of, of libraries doing interesting, innovative things uh, with uh, technologies. We have a special focus on connectivity, uh, wireless connectivity, fiber connectivity. We've been doing this since 2007. We initiated Fiber the Library as a campaign to connect all the libraries, first in the US where we're based, with the fiber connection is the, the smartest, fastest, quickest, least expensive way to deliver next generation broadband into every community is to connect all 17,000 US public libraries. We evolved through that, that is to say fiber to the library and wireless through the library as a way to extend that incredibly valuable service that libraries provide, which is access to the internet uh, in large part through Wi-Fi. And so, that's what we've been doing for the past several years in a, a range of different wireless technologies. I won't go into that, but the latest one is around this new service uh, from space, broadband from space. It's mind boggling, but it seems to work. Uh, our starting point here is connectivity is essential, but it's insufficient. This is a quote from the former president of the World Bank who made this statement. And of course, yes, connectivity is great, but you need devices, you need skills and so forth, but it is essential. So roughly three and a half billion people in the world are not connected to the internet. I mean, still after all these billions and billions of dollars in investment, and uh, decades of a kind of a goal that everybody should have the opportunity to connect, to the world's digital information. <laughs> it's just not happening. It's not happening anywhere. It's not happening in the US. I mean, little by little, but there are still tens of millions of people in the US that, are, that don't have any kind of broadband connection or any kind of decent connection. And it's, it's a travesty. Uh, it used to be in the US, there's this principle of universal service. And it, it said that when a service becomes like a basic service, like electricity or telephone, then everybody should have affordable access to it. And the way that was done was by balancing out these markets, the, the wealthy, dense, easier, cheaper to serve urban markets with these more expensive rural markets and uh, move funds from the urban markets to support the rural markets, more expensive markets. Uh, but that went away with the arrival of the web in the mid nineties, the, the Telecommunications companies said, well, that's different. This is information business, information services. And so we're just like Cisco and Intel and the other technology companies. Don't, don't tell us what we have to do. We'll just decide what we want to do based on our expectation return. And so that has just left a lot of people hanging because it's already expensive to do it. And if there's no support, for subsidizing these expensive markets, then they don't happen. <clears throat> and that's what we are today. And it's not just the US, it's around the world. So um, uh, Carrie is moderating our session today. So if anybody has a question, it's urgent, you know, raise your hand, Carrie will try to keep track of uh, any questions and we can stop and do it or we can do it at the end. So that's the point that I just made, but there's a new service that it really changes the model here. <clears throat> excuse me, that um, there have been satellite communications for a long time, but it's from satellites that are farther away from the earth, like 22 something thousand miles, 35,000 kilometers or more. And in that, that distance, uh, these were set up originally for just broadcast, at least in terms of uh, consumer technology, but then they were trying to alter them to be two way uh, data communications. Well, it takes time for radio signals at the speed of light to travel out and back uh, from these. And so it creates latency and delays. The frequencies are used or susceptible to interference. And they're generally 
not people are not really that happy, but it's the only game in town in a lot of places until now. And now there is a low Earth orbit technology that's just coming to be. We're going to talk about one of those, the, the first one really out there with services. But this is now very close to, to the Earth. Let's, you know, the Earth. So let's say the, the, uh, the geostationary satellites are like three diameters out from the, from the Earth. The low Earth orbit are like 500 kilometers. So it'd be, you know, just this a tiny distance. And, and that means you have to have a lot of them and they go all around in a, in, a, in a maze. So it also allows faster services and much less lag time. So this is new and we think it's interesting and possibly really groundbreaking. We don't know that. We don't know if these systems will actually work. This is the early stages of these. But we think libraries should be at the forefront of investigating, monitoring, and reporting on the capability of this new technology, which it has the potential to serve anyone on the planet, which is, you know, that's significant. So uh, we'll just have to find out. <clears throat> so we're going to look at how it works, and I'll talk about some of the details of it. So Starlink from, is a subsidiary of, of SpaceX, which is the only currently operational LEO system out there. Uh, they're still not quite commercial. They're, in, they're still in a beta stage, but they have 100,000 beta residential customers. And that's their target. That's what they say. We're, we wanna serve residential customers first, and we want to serve the ones that are the least served, the ones that are farthest away, the ones that have the worst service, uh, because that's what we can do. We actually can reach out beyond the existing infrastructure. So I mentioned the, the, the and so here's the prices they're charging for these beta. Maybe it'll probably be their commercial prices as well. Uh, it's $100 a month and you have to pay $500 up front for the equipment. I'll show you some images in a minute. Uh, there's one caveat is that, yeah, you can go up into space and come down and have fast connections, but they need ground stations currently. That is a fiber connected ground station that then can service the satellites. And so that's a handicap because there are a lot of places that are really remote that they can, and it's also kind of expensive to set up one of these things. What they're doing just now is launching a new series of satellites that, are, that can connect directly to each other using laser communication. So satellite to satellite laser communication doesn't require as many downlinks. There has to be a downlink to reach the internet, of course, but there don't have to be as many of them. And uh, if you're going through space, the vacuum of space, that these signals can move even faster than they can through fiber because there's a vacuum up there and there's no resistance. Uh, so it's pretty interesting. And for us, it's, it's exciting, especially if it works, and especially if it can serve people and libraries anywhere. So these speeds they're advertising are 50 to 100 megabit, 150 megabits per second. Many of them are already coming in at over that, over 200 megabits. And they promised 300 megabits per second by the end of this year, and even higher speeds to come. What this, what the, the way this works is that if you want to be a provider of this kind of service, you have to get permission from each national regulator to operate in that country. That means they have to give you permission to use specific frequencies, a specific frequency uh, a spectrum in that country. And so far there were, well, as of yesterday, there were 14 countries. As, as of today, uh, Chile gave approval to Starlink to operate commercial services in their country. It's the first, it's the first country in uh, Latin America. To have uh, to have opened this up, but it means that Starlink has to go around to every every country and every regulator and ask for permission. So it's kind of slow, but that's the that's the nature of the game in spectrum. There are dozens more in different processes uh, stages of, of getting that approval. So this is a a pretty crude but illustrative map of what these satellites have to do. So if you're twenty two thousand miles out. One satellite can see roughly a third of the planet. Three of them you can see all, all sides of it, maybe not the poles. With this so close to the planet, you need hundreds, you need thousands of them. 
and currently they have roughly 2,000 up there right now. Uh, their first kind of shell or plateau they're talking about is 4,000 going to 14 or 30,000. Just a phenomenal number of these things buzzing around each other so that they hand off to your downlink station. Uh, it's kind of like the, the cell system, only, you know, as we go down the road, our phones hand off from one tower to another tower. This flips that where the towers are buzzing around and you're stationary and the towers are handing off. So it's, it's just incredible technology, uh, mind boggling to me. And this is, this is the coverage. The way they actually reach locations on the earth is through these cells, which are kind of areas of where satellites will crisscross and make these uh, hexagonal areas. And they have to go one by one through these areas uh, to establish coverage, and it's it's painstaking, and it and it, and they're adding more satellites, trying to cover more area all the time. So this is what they look like. Uh, that upper left corner is is the kit. It's the dish, which is less than a meter, as you can see from the lower left image, and then it comes with a mount. It comes with a cable, a hundred foot cable. And it even in includes a, uh, a router, which is that little white rectangle in the upper left. <clears throat> so the way this works is you get it out of the box, you plug it in, it's an ethernet cable, and you, you set it up somewhere, and it turns itself on, and it, and it points itself up in the sky and says, here I am. And the satellites overhead get the signal and say, okay, we see you, you are now unit 26 BQ, whatever. And these are your assignments. These are the satellites you'll be communicating with. And that's it. And then the, the Wi-Fi is live and you're live. So it's literally plug and play. This is especially important in places that have, well, very little tech ability or support that you can just plug it in and it sets itself up and then you can just connect to the Wi-Fi router just like that. This in the lower right is a, a ground station. Well, these are all protected uh, Earth's antennas that, that talk to the satellites. So the very first uh, LEO library is a name that we give to these. These are not libraries in low Earth orbit. These are libraries using low Earth orbit satellite connectivity. It's just our name, LEO libraries. So this is the first one in, in the world, in the history of Earth. This is the first library connected by this technology. And uh, the the library director was just on the plenary panel. I hope you made that, uh, Rochelle. Uh, and they're, you know, they're excited because they went from a, a geostationary, slow uh, connected satellite to a very fast connection. And the community is excited about it. This is the second uh, LEO library in Conrad, Montana. And here on the left, they're kind of mugging it up where their satellite arrives in what is effectively a giant pizza box. Uh, and the guy there in the baseball cap is the head of the city IT for Conrad. Uh, Conrad. And, you know, they kind of made a fun thing out of it. But in fact, they set it up when they, th these were fun, these were both funded out of an IMLS, Institute for Museum and Library Services uh, grant that we won to do this, to do this and more. But one of the things, one of the wireless projects was this. And so we provided uh, the, the funding for this to happen <clears throat> for the first year. Well, uh, they turned it on, they got 250 megabit connection uh, and the city IT guy, you know, he, he went nuts. He said, this is great because, you know, nobody, in a lot of these places, you may know if you're out in one of them, you just don't have much for connectivity. The city heard that the library had won this award and upgraded their connectivity to 25 megabits connection. They upgraded to 25 megabit connection. And suddenly they went up 10 times from that with this dish automatically, just like that. And so the, the library IT guy, he posted that on his Facebook and he had 300 people say, this is great, I want one. And just people around there, around in Conrad, Montana. So Montana actually, by the way, has the worst connectivity of any state in the country. And they, they need these kinds of things. Let me just say right here, we're not, we're not advocates or agents for Starlink. It's just they're the first ones out there with this technology. There are others coming, uh, OneWeb, uh, Several national governments are doing the Europeans, Chinese. So this is a this is a new thing. It's a it's a, 
a, a burgeoning thing. <laughs> so we were able to negotiate an agreement with Starlink to outfit a handful of libraries under a provisional beta license. So the beta licenses they have for these 100,000 users, those are residential. So a library is not, a library is an enterprise, so-called, like, like a business or anything else. <clears throat> and so we were able to negotiate these beta enterprise licenses for uh, a, a handful of libraries. And we're in the process of those coming up. There are two that are just being set up now in uh, Utah uh, on by the state library on Bureau of Land Management property. So it's like a, not a, uh, a formal uh, branch, but then these become library kiosks. This is an important point under E-rate, that a kiosk is eligible for E-rate subsidy, like a bookmobile uh, or any legitimate annex for a library system can pay for that. There's a requirement that the provider has to be certified. Starlink has not yet gone through that paperwork, but it's inevitable that they will. And even if they don't, it's, it's really uh, interesting uh, technology to explore. And that's, that's what we want, is we want, we want libraries everywhere to have these. There's, there's roughly 400,000 public libraries on the planet. And at least 100,000 of those are rural or poorly connected. And that would be our hope is that in these places, this three and a half billion people, they live somewhere, that the library could be the first point of entry. It's also in typical library uh, economics, a way for a community to pool resources, acquire a resource, and then share it if it's even on a limited basis. So if we could, if libraries could, you know, you just mail this out. You don't have to have an installer. You don't have to have, you have to have electricity. And so that's not trivial since it's necessary in a lot of places it might be it might be a challenge but assuming you have something in the order of 150 watts uh, of power you can drive one of these units <laughs> and the potential to drop uh, a resource like that down into a village or a neighborhood that is full of, full of people that are that are unserved we think it's really the kind of exciting possibility so we're working with the international federation of library associations we're working with the Internet Society and a number of other international groups to try to formulate a plan to do that. So it's it's simple on conceptually. It's a little bit complicated in, in the in the reality because there have to be permissions from the national regulators. There has to be money to buy these. There has to be somebody that's responsible for it. But that doesn't seem like a huge a huge demand given uh, the current situation, which is basically nothing in so many places. We just had a survey, not just, but about five years ago, they did a survey of the libraries in California. What kind of speed connections do you have? And nearly 30% of the 1200 libraries in California came back and said, we've got a T1, which means a 1.5 megabit connection in California. That's like, you know, 400, Libraries in California only had a megabit or a megabit and a half connection. Unacceptable. California has stepped up. They've passed state laws there and they're, they're running fiber, but they still can't get everywhere. And even terrestrial wireless, you know, microwaves, towers, you know, over the landscape still have edges. Well, this technology, if it all works, which the jury, we have to find out, but if it works, it will reach beyond the current infrastructure or even the projected infrastructure. As I said in the beginning, this is a market failure because, well, people just don't have it in nearly half, nearly half the world doesn't have internet. And we think it was like, we're to the point where it's annoying to us and there are people that, that don't even have it. And it's our view that COVID having changed everything, that it's even more important that everyone have the opportunity to connect, even if it's not in their home, someplace close by that they can go get help, get support, get the use of devices, and find resources and opportunities, educational, commercial, social, that they never had before, if they want to. It's not 
not, no, not a forced deal here at all. So we want, we want anybody that's interested in this to join in. And, you know, if you're in a place that has coverage and it's not, you're not in a city where they're not looking to deploy these, uh, then we'll help try to set you up. Now, hopefully these will come, become a commercial offering soon where anybody could just go online and sign up and, and ask for one. We're trying to work that out right now. In the meantime, uh, we're tracking this, we're negotiating with them, and we're uh, uh, looking to connect libraries with Starlink or anybody else that's uh, ready to support libraries, anybody else uh, with uh, services. We think these actually should be in every library, even, even if it's a, a place that has a connection, this would be very valuable as a backup because consider uh, uh, any kind of lights out scenario in a community, actually where I'm from in California, I'm not there right now, but they've got huge uh, outage from the current storms, which is increasingly common, electrical out, uh, electricity outages or even internet outages. So if this system, it bypasses the local infrastructure and if you have a power source and you have a dish, you're connected. How valuable would that be in a, in a general outage or disaster, weather disaster scenario? Very is the answer to that. So if you want to kind of join this exploration, as we call it, send us a note there at info at, uh, at giglibraries.net. Put LEO libraries in the subject line, and you'll be part of this group that is growing uh, pretty quickly. So that's it uh, for the presentation. We have another seven minutes, according to my clock, if anybody has any questions. So. Thank you. I've been writing them down um, the, the, from the chat. The okay. first one is, um, do solar flares impact this system? That depends. Solar flares could impact any electronics if they were aimed in the right direction. It depends on the direction of the flare and the intensity of the flare. So it could, but we have there are no reports of it that we've gotten. Okay. Uh, and, and because these satellites are close to the Earth using 12 gigahertz frequency, which is a, a good frequency, that it can transfer a lot of data, um, it may be more immune than the geostationary satellites that are farther out, a lot more space to travel through but none we've heard of. Great. Um, a few people had questions about availability in Alaska and you had a phrase, maybe not at the polls, I'm wondering what that meant. Well, uh, the, the way they deployed them and they're still deploying in stages is that the first areas were kind of the Northern latitudes. So kind of the US Canadian border uh, and, and all around the earth at that, at that level. And the, and the complementary one in the southern area where they didn't have it and in, in, are still kind of weak is at the uh, tropical uh, latitudes and at the polar latitudes. But they've just launched a new batch. They launched these things 50 at a time. It, was, it used to be 60, now it's 50, 51, because the new ones have this uh, satellite to satellite direct laser communication I mentioned. So they're a little bigger, but these are roughly the size of a refrigerator and they can put a stack of them. That was the opening slide was the, uh, uh, the inside look or the, you can see the rack there. Uh, those are all satellites and then they let them go and they all kind of go off into their orbits. And so the last batch that has this laser to laser, they're doing in polar orbits and specifically to reach the most difficult places that not even the geostationary satellites seem to be able to reach in the in the very highest latitudes. So I don't know exactly if they're operational or how much, but they they should be coming pretty quickly because they're doing several batches of those. Great. And um, questions As I said, about you know, sign in and you know we'll we'll pass the news along. There's a there's a subreddit. You know, you can imagine, of course, there's a subreddit for Starlink has a lot of information, a lot of people that have been waiting for these. Even there's 100,000 out there, there's a half a million people that have ordered it. So right. everybody's waiting. They're trying not to overload a particular cell because they want the performance to stay high. 
as they add more satellites and open more cells, depending on how many people are in what area, then that's the way they, uh, they award them. Sorry, go ahead, Gary. Um, someone had a question about the line of sight and they wondered about mountains and trees. They, it doesn't go through that. There's an app on your phone and you can uh, point it in the sky and it will tell you if you have obstructions. But if you do, like you can't be under a tree or behind a mountain, uh, you need, well, the app will tell you, but you need some open space. So either on the roof or maybe out in a field or even on a tower, uh, you can check. Uh, but it does, it's, it's not like low frequencies, like in the TV band that have penetrating capabilities that can pass through foliage. Uh, this doesn't do that very well. And is this available to individuals at their homes? Yes, if they're lucky enough to be selected. That's the 100,000 that they're out there. Those are, those are individual residences that have been selected. They applied early, the area was covered, and they gave them an okay. And then, then they went ahead and conducted the sale. Uh, and, and, but there, there are hundreds of thousands of people waiting to be notified that, uh, that theirs is ready to be shipped if they'll then just conclude the, the transaction the sale. So it's, it's available on availability uh, in different places. You have an advantage where there's not many people using it, where they have coverage, you're at an advantage. Uh, I just ordered one. We have a, a second place in Southwest France and I ordered one um, it, and I got the okay just after we left. <laughs> It's still, it's an area that's not covered. And so it didn't take but about uh, six weeks to fill the order. Others have been waiting for nine months and some have even you know, canceled their order. They're just frustrated because they, it, it's not coming through. It's just growing. This is early stage. That's why we want the libraries there involved to, to test these out and, and kind of show the way. And like the example I gave in, in Montana, from Starlink standpoint, this should be to their advantage so that people will, you know, libraries play this role of showcase and demo site for a lot of information technology, all the way back to books themselves, or even first generation broadband where people say, oh, that's what they were talking about. They were telling me all this bits and, and fire hoses and stuff. Now I, I see what they mean. I'm streaming my hometown radio station. You know, I'm talking about the 90s. It was a big deal. And people say, wow, that's cool. I want that at home. And so... This is another reason I think Starlink should uh, support this is because it should help them uh, demo their, their service. Great. But you have to be patient. <laughs> is there a map of areas that are currently covered? There is, and I, I wish I had it. It's, I would prowl around the Starlink site and look for such a thing. I, I, I read about it on the Reddit, sub, subreddit. Uh, and so I think something exists uh, that shows those cells. And then they'll also announce, like they just announced that all of Germany is now covered uh, and another country, another new country. So it's just, it's just coming out. I think there is, I would look at it on the Starlink site. I should have that, I apologize. Oh, you're doing great. Uh, this is so interesting. Will the slides be shared? I'm happy to, uh, you're recording them. Uh, well, the recording is is, yeah. is shared wherever uh, Library 2.0 is, and so that is the slides. Uh, send me an email. I'd be happy to send you the slides. Info at giglibraries.net. Okay. Uh, uh, yes, and this session is being uh, recorded. Um, someone wants to know the cost. So uh, the 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 residential cost is hundred dollars a month. The enterprise cost is not yet public, and I'm bound under a non-disclosure agreement not to say what we paid for these trial systems, but it's more than the residential. Okay. But they haven't published it. They don't, there's not an actual commercial offering yet, or even a, a general open beta offering. These are just private negotiated uh, sites that we've started with. But it's coming uh, sooner, I hope. And is there a way to get a system for rural libraries on a grant? 
Well, to them, money is money. Uh, so if you can get money from a grant or if you can pass the hat around the community, you know, whatever works for you. Right. I would say this would be easily valuable for a community to pass a hat on, do a little crowdfunding uh, because it's such a valuable and, and dramatically improved resource. Uh, but yeah, there are a lot of grants around. Uh, and once, uh, once they get their E-rate uh, provider certification, then you'd get it under a discount. But yeah. they haven't done that yet. They have a lot of things to do. I would, if I could, if I could get it, and I were a community, and I were a library, I'd find a way to pay for it at whatever you know, almost whatever they want for the interim time until it became uh, E-rate eligible. I want to respect everyone's time and recognize that it is five thirty-two, and our official time is over. Um, so I just want to thank Don. Um, I know everyone joins me. This was really interesting and really gives me hope for humanity that we can connect um, more people. We want this to be a global libraries project. We want all the libraries, even the ones with connections, to feel like they have an opportunity and obligation to connect all libraries and through all libraries, anyone. And so that's what we welcome you to join in, understand this. It's valuable to know wireless technologies, whether you're providing it or buying it. It's super valuable. It's only going to be more valuable as the time goes along. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, everyone, for attending. And thank you again, Don. Well, thank you, Carrie, for your facilitation and the time. It's been great. I'm sorry if it, it was too superficial, but tune in again. We'll be deeper. We'll be having a, a, a direct session under our libraries and response uh, uh, Zoom series. We've done 57 of these since the pandemic started. You can find the link, uh, the pandemic response link at giglibraries.net and you'll see all, all of them are recorded and archived. And we'll be doing another in-depth on this. Thanks, Carrie, I really appreciate it. Sure, thank you. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.